data is a, is a funny old thing, isn't it? I mean, we, we have data everywhere. You know, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, we are either gathering data with the applications that we build, or you know, even the people we talk to, data doesn't have to be on a hard disk. Um, and you know, we're generating data, even by being sat here. You probably have a smartphone. Google probably knows exactly where you are. A little bit scary. Um, and we do see a lot of examples of data being used badly. Hi, Facebook. Um, but I think you know, machine learning is, is a very important topic at the moment. It's a topic that you know, I've seen lots more talks kind of coming up in the past few years and lots of people attending such talks. And I think that's because there is this interest in, you know, we have this data. We know it can be used for evil, uh, for want of a better term. Can it also be used you know, responsibly and for good? Uh, in TEBEX's example, that's about being able to protect players and protect server owners. Uh, before I go on any further, I just want to say very quickly thanks to the organizers. Um, I think this is my fifth year at PHP UK, and Joe and Sam and the rest of the team every year do a really good job. Uh, the staff here you know, are great in, you know, they, they've done this now a number of times, and it works really well every year. So, you know, personally, I'd like to say thanks to, to them. And, you know, I, I ask you, if you get two minutes and you, you speak to Sam, you speak to Joe, one of the other organizers or volunteers, just, just say thanks, because it makes a huge difference. Uh, so who am I? My name's Liam Wiltshire, and I'm the CTO for a, a small company called Tebex. Now, you, if, you, if you run servers for like Minecraft or stuff, you might have heard of us. Uh, if not, you probably haven't, but we provide uh, a monetization platform for community-hosted servers on games such as those. So being a, a monetization platform, which is basically a fancy way of saying payment processor, we have an issue with chargebacks. You know, anyone in the e-commerce industry, anyone that deals with money, that deals with processing payments, this is always this, there's always this issue. Um, so Braintree, they're not a big fan of our merchants. Stripe don't exactly like us either. I will say at this point, throughout this talk, I will use the word chargeback. I'm not necessarily talking about credit card uh, Section 5 chargebacks. I could also be talking about PayPal disputes or mechanisms on, on other gateways, other payment platforms. It's that process of saying, I didn't approve this charge, I want it back. You know, I'm using chargebacks as a collective term. Um, but, you know, I'm saying that chargebacks are bad. I'm saying that Stripe and Braintree aren't, aren't our best friends. But, you know, we're not, we're not talking about loads of chargebacks, right? I mean, it's, it's no big deal. 0. Half a percent. It's not bad. Yeah, that's not us. That's clothing and apparel. So things like misguided, things like you know, the online fashion retailers, they experience about a half percent chargeback rate on, on purchases. So it's okay. Yeah, okay. It'd be half percent would be nice, it's not too much. But 0.56%. Yeah, no, that's media and e-content. This one scares me a little because media and e-content includes, you know, those things where it's like, get rich in seven days by buying this ebook. Woo! And you would think the chargebacks were high on that, but actually they fall under this category, and it's you know, 0.56%. It's not too bad. So now we're leaving the 0.5s behind, 0.65%. So again, it's not too bad. It's still not us. <laughs> this is fine. Now this one I find amusing, financial services. So people who are like buying financial advice or investment advice or whatever else, and then charging back. It's like, hang on, you, you know that they work in the finance industry, right? They're going to win, but yeah, it's fine. So no, so it's not half a percent, it's not 0.65%. Actually, across our network, uh, our charge rate is about 0.85%. It's not the end of the world, because like, as long as you're below about a 1% threshold, you're kind of okay. You get above 1%, people start asking questions. Uh, but you know, we're okay. But we are still, for 2018, for example, talking about nearly 24,000 payments. So, you know what, if there's something that, that we can do about this, that would be good. Now, the, the kind of thing that people often think is, well, if people are charging back, surely your, you know, our merchants, the, the people that use our platform to sell, must be doing something wrong. Uh, and that's kind of logical. But it's not always the case. So this is a definition of a chargeback from which 
Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, which is a, a consumer association based here in the UK. And they say that a chargeback should be used in cases of goods not arriving at all, goods that are damaged, goods that are different from the description, or where the merchant has ceased trading. So that's a, that's a pretty clear definition, right? You know, we can say from there, quite clearly, we know that there are kind of four particular cases where a chargeback would be a, a relevant course of action. So in our experience, is this how chargebacks are used? No. We see plenty of examples of players who will charge back just because. And they will actually admit it to us. Uh, one of the things that we currently do is, if a player charges back, we don't share that data, we don't say the specific number of chargebacks, but other web stores across the network can say, well, I don't want to deal with players who have a chargeback rating of above 10%. For example, we, we will never tell them, oh, this player has this chargeback rating. We just won't let the, that person purchase silently. So the stores don't know. We're not sharing the data or anything like that, but we are kind of adding that protection. But then we'll have players that will come to us and go, oh, well, I know I charged back, but I got bored of playing on that server. That's not a reason to charge back. That's ridiculous. Or they'll go, well, you know, I bought this thing, and then they banned me. I said, well, why did, why did they ban you? Well, I was cheating. So they banned you, and then you've charged back because they banned you because you were cheating. This doesn't make sense. And sometimes they do actually just to attack another player because you know, a lot of our stores will allow you to buy for other players. Um, so I can go, well, actually, I, I've got a good friend online. I want to buy him this rank. I want to buy him this, this sword or whatever else. And I can buy it for him, and he receives the sword, and I pay for it, and it's great. But then uh, those, some players will buy something for someone else, then charge it back just to get them in trouble. It's a bit ridiculous. And clearly, these, these things aren't the server owner's fault. And, a lot, and sometimes, these things aren't even the player who's getting punished's fault. It's someone else that's causing it. So you know, we want to see what we can do to protect the server owners and to protect those honest players. So we set ourselves a bit of a challenge. We have you know, a lot of data, um, something like 18 million payment records last time I checked. So we want to try and help our server owners as much as possible. You know, if we can use our existing data to try and predict if a given payment is likely, be, likely to be charged back in the future, if we can avoid false positives as much as possible, because ultimately if you've got lots of false positives, no one will trust the system, and it's a waste of time. And it would be nice if we could also provide feedback as to why we flagged a particular payment for review then that's going to make our platform a better platform. It's going to make our merchants happier. And it will actually protect the players as well. How hard can it be? As I've mentioned, I have been to some machine learning talks before. So when we started bounding this idea around at work, I went, I, I, I must be able to remember something, anything. L literally, like my brain's not that useless. Well, it is, but that's a story for another day. And from somewhere, from the depths of my memory, two words cropped up. Supervised learning. Now, it, it sounds great that those words cropped up. I could not remember what they meant at all. So what did I do? I Googled it, of course. Uh, it turns out that actually supervised learning was exactly what we wanted. So I was like, hey, look at me. I look smart. That was awesome. Um, because supervised learning uh, basically involves you know, giving a, a learning function a set of training data with known answers. So in our instance, we have payment data, and we know for historical payment data whether it was charged back or whether it wasn't, whether it's a good payment or whether it's a bad payment. We have the, we, for that set of data, we know the answer. Um, and then you give your learning function that data with those answers, and then it'll analyze that data, and then it will use that data to provide answers for previously unseen data next time. So you've trained it with these known things, and you say, right, we have this new piece of data. We don't know what the answer is. Can you give us an answer, please? The opposite of supervised learning is, well, unsupervised learning. Kind of makes sense. And that's a little bit different in that you don't have answers. You give it data, and then you say, dear Mr. Learning Function, can you kind of sort this mess out for us and tell us how this stuff should be grouped, because we don't know. Uh, but because we know the answers, we don't need to do that, which I then read makes our lives a lot easier. When we're talking about supervised learning, we're normally trying to solve one of two problems. 
Um, it's either classification, so that means you're trying to give something a label. So, for example, is this thing an apple or an orange? Is this tumor malignant or benign? Hopefully it's benign. The other th question that you could be trying to answer is what we call regression. So that's when you say, right, given this, 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 data, this, this data set, where along a line would it fit? So a good example of that is if I've got data for 50 houses, I have the number of bedrooms, the floor space, the number of bathrooms, the, number of, the amount of outside space, and the price, I can plot those. And then when I get a new property that I don't have a price for, I can say, right, given that this pro property has four bedrooms, this amount of floor space, two bathrooms, this amount of outside space, what price should it be? And it will use the data it already has to kind of work down the line and be like, oh, well, it would go there. So it should be 150,000 pounds if you don't live in London. Um, so, you know, because we just want it to say, is it this thing or is it that thing, we quite you know, clearly want to look at classification. So that's all good. So we know we're doing classification. We know that we're doing supervised learning. So now, it's just the simple job of finding an algorithm. Simple, honest. There are lots of potential algorithms for machine learning. Um, and there are lots of algorithms for classification in particular. As a complete aside, if, if you don't recognize the, these styles of comics, this is from XKCD. Uh, they're hilarious. They're well worth checking out. You, you'll find it. I use them a lot in my talks. Um, one of the things that we did say for ourselves, a kind of rule that we set, is we are not data scientists. I failed math at school. I, I don't have a clue. So I'm a software engineer. I want to use something that's simple enough that even a moron like me can understand it. So we, went, we literally Googled simple machine learning classification algorithm and came up with the naive Bayes classifier. If you do kind of do any research, this is the one that will normally come up first. Um, it's the one that's fairly straightforward. Um, it's based around categorizing text. So it, it's used a lot in things like spam filters um, or language detection, uh, things like that. Um, so that's what we started. Effectively, what it does is it says, right, given this block of text, the probability is it belongs in X category or the probability is it belongs in Y category. Um, it's a fairly simple algorithm. You take in your block of text, you split it into individual words. Uh, you standardize the words where possible. So that might be removing plurals. That might be in, if it's in a language, say French, where adjectives, the ending changes based on the gender of the subject. You might standardize those, that sort of thing. Um, and then you literally loop through every single word, you loop through every single category of test data, and you work out the percentage of times that word appears in each category. So the word balloon, for example, might appear 60% of the time in, English, in, in the English category in our test data, and 40% of the time in the French one because it means ball. Thanks for confusing things. Um, and then you go through every single word, you then give each one a percentage. You then say, right, for each category, what is the average probability based on all the words we've been through? And then you go, right, OK, so on balance of probability, this block of text is likely to be French, or it's likely to be English, or whatever the result might be. 100%. That's not how effective it is. I wish it was, because this would be a really short talk. No, 100% is the percentage of previous talks where I haven't done a demo. Now, I do not do live demos. In fact, whenever someone does a live demo, and there may be speakers in the room that can attest to this, I go, up to you and I go up to them and go, why would you do a live demo? I don't get it. Guess what? Live demo time. This could be horrendous. So that's running. That's good. Good start. So this is uh, a fairly simple language predictor. Let's try and make that a little bit bigger, shall we? There we go. So. At the moment, this is just a simple naive based classifier. There is no training data at the moment. Hence the fact I've given there's this piece of text in French. I'm not even going to try and mangle it, but it doesn't know what language it is. Each time I tell it what the language is, it will then add that to its training data. So for this first one, I'm going to say is French. So type F for French. 
That one is German, so I'll type D for Deutsch. Uh, this one is English, so this is E, and English again, and hopefully in a minute. There we are. It's come up, and this one, granted we've already trained this one exactly, it's fine. Because it's looked through those words, and they've now been in the training data, and it's gone, oh, okay, I recognize those words. The probability is that these words are going to be in a piece of text that is English. And we'll say, yes, that's correct. So this is one we haven't done. Don't throw good money after bad. Again, some of those words have been in the other data that we've used to train it, so it's now gone, oh, this is English too. Uh, that's English. And this one is French. It doesn't know that one. And so on. I could keep going around, and it's recognized that one as French again. So as you give it more training data, it will become more accurate. That's the naive base classifier in a nutshell. Thank you, and good night. No. Um, not so much good night. That's all well and good. That worked. That was a very quick demo that we hacked together that went, oh, this, this makes sense. Awesome. It's all very well and good being able to classify text, but what if we're not dealing with text? Um, what if we're dealing with, with numbers? Well, actually, it's quite straightforward. If you, in that pseudocode that I said earlier, if you replace the word words with tokens, you're doing the same thing, but now a token can represent anything, right? I mean, we use tokens in PHP. To everything, everything we write in PHP is, is turned into tokens, and they represent certain things, and they do operations on the stack, and everything's great. Um, so this is it's the same thing. So here's an example for describing fruit. OK, fine, let's assume that you know, red and round and, C, uh, and green and crescent are words anyway. So you could just leave those as words. But let's assume in our database of our test data, we just have a binary column for seed and stone. We couldn't just say one or zero because it wouldn't actually know what it related to. It wouldn't know that in Apple, the one related to it having a seed and the zero related to it not having a stone. It would just say, oh, well, there's a one and there's a zero. It, it, there is no context. But by prefixing them with a little bit of you know, color red, shape round, seed one, stone zero, we're saying that it's red, it's round, it has a seed, and it doesn't have a stone. Now, we can use that, we can stick that into an algorithm, and it will understand the context, effectively. So that's what we did. Uh, we took all our data that we wanted to use, and we basically prefixed it with each thing with something, so each token was unique. So even if the same number came up twice, in two different contexts, or the same word. Let's say we happen to have a gateway that was called USD and a currency called USD. If it just said USD, you wouldn't know what it was relating to. But by turning it into a token with some form of prefix, now they have separate context. There is actually, within a, a library called PHPML, which we'll come on to in a little bit, there is actually a tokenizer function. Uh, there's a really good reason we didn't use it. We didn't know it existed. Uh, something that's interesting on this particular line, you'll notice there's a token called sig fig, significant figure. Uh, there's a reason for this. We Googled something and we read it, and they said it was a good idea, so we did it. Um, there's a thing, slightly more detail, there's a thing called Benford's Law, which suggests that in financial transactions, certain significant figures should happen more frequently than others. Um, I couldn't tell you which ones, because I can't remember. But it was something that they said, you know, there was this, this big paper that we read, we read, and we understood like half of it, and we're like, yeah, that sounds good, let's put it in, see what happens. Uh, experiment. Notice here how also we have, on the first line, we have country and gateway as two individual tokens, and then on this third line, we have a token called country gateway. Now, that's because the, uh, in the naive base classifier, the naive part relates to how there is no assumed relation between the individual tokens. So there's, not a, there's no sense of, because this is a one, if this is something else, it should be seen as odd or, or not. Um, everything, every word or every token is taken in complete isolation. Obviously, in our data set, that might not be the case. Um, a gateway, for example, such as Ideal, is used a lot in mainland Europe, um, isn't used at all in China, for example. So if someone who was from China was using Ideal, we'd be like, OK, well, perhaps we need to put a question mark on that. Whereas you know, having them as two individual tokens, there would be nothing to say that it's odd or not, or you know, whatever. So we added that as a, as a combined token. And then we ran a test. So 
for, for most of the tests that we did, we used our 2018 data as our training data, and then we picked re records at random from 2017 to test it against. So in this instance, we took 100 records of known good payments from 2017 and 100 rows that we know were charged back from 2017. 200 rows. So far, so good. There are no false positives. It's not looked at any of those payment records that were good and actually gone, I think this is a chargeback. And bear in mind, our, one of our main aim was to avoid false positives. That's really good. It didn't identify any fraud either, though. <laughs> yeah. This, this went well. So what it's saying there is every single record, even those 100 ones that we know are chargebacks, it thinks we're all fine. Yeah. That wasn't a good day, that one. <laughs> I went home slightly sad. Um, moral of the story, don't base everything you try and do on one Google search. <laughs> do at least two. So we didn't really know what the problem was to start with because we'd done one Google search. We had to do some further research, and we learnt our first important lesson. Imbalanced data is the enemy. Many machine learning algorithms, not all, I will caveat, but many are sensitive, sensitive to an imbalance of data. If one category has just more data in general than others, there will be a natural bias towards that category. In our instance, we have 2.8 million good payments and about 24,000 chargebacks. So it's a little, little bit imbalanced, T tiny, tiny bit. And, and it kind of does make sense when you think about it. If, again, if you think of the word, let, let's, let's think about fruit for a second. Some apples are red, and some apples are green. Most cherries are red. Yeah? So far, we, we agree with that statement. If, however, you have a, training, a set of training data with 50,000 apples, and 500 cherries, according to your training data, the word red is many, many times more likely, I, can't, I told you I suck at math, many, many times more likely to appear as an apple than a cherry, even though actually if something's red, it's probably only a 50% chance it's an apple and probably more likely it's a cherry. But because our data is imbalanced, it will never come to that conclusion, right? So. In an in a odd way, our first algorithm was actually really accurate. I mean, I mean technically, it was over 99% accurate. Or it would have, over an entire set of training, if we gave it all our payment data, it would correctly identify over 99% of them, because over 99% are good payments. Completely useless, but accurate. So you have to kind of come, a, come up with ways of, of fixing this. Um, there are some solutions. The, uh, I guess the, the, the obvious one is collect more data. Now, that's not really going to work for us because we can't exactly email people and be like, hey, players, start charging back now. It's, no, I, I would be out of a job if I did that. Um, so we can't really do that. That's not going to work. You could look at changing your metrics. So as, as I mentioned, the, the classifier that we're using is based on probability. Okay? It says there's a, a probability of it being one category or the other. So what we could actually do is, is lower our threshold and say, well, OK, even if the highest probability is it's a good payment, if it's over 35% likely to be in the fraud category, perhaps we flag all of those. That, that might be a way of doing it. Or the other option is to resample your data. Now, that, that has kind of two subsets. So you can either undersample the overrepresented data. So in our instance, we could just pick 1% of all our payments and put that into our training data. Or you can oversample the underrepresented categories. In other words, you change the weighting. So you make, you make one vote in the fraud category worth 99 times as much as a vote in the non-fraud category, or whatever. Um, and so, so you, you kind of balance it up that way. So you end up with a, a, the same amount of data, even though some of the day, you know, records will be replicated in one. You end up with the same number of records, so there's an even weighting. Um, as I said, we can't realistically collect more data. We can't ask people to start creating more chargebacks. Um, it's pretty stupid. So we mixed resampling and, we, and changed our metric. We upsampled the fraud records to generate more data, and then we down, downsampled the OK records. Uh, we then also just returned the probability of the, fraud, of the fraud label, regardless of what it was, just to see if there was any kind of any, any pattern. And then we ran another test. So again, we pulled 200 records, 100 of each. Now, we've started moving the needle. 
Okay? It's not all zero, zero, 100. It's, you know, we, we've got, you know, obviously absolute bollocks, if you excuse my language, but, you know, we've got, it's done something. It's, it's you know, that's, that's, the, that's the definition of progress, right? It's broken differently to last time. Um, you know, the accuracy is like 50%. It's terrible. Um, we looked at the fraud probability thing, but given that we're already flagging 71% false positives, we were like, this is a waste of time. Uh, we kind of gave up on that quite quickly. So, I mean, it was quite frustrating. Okay? We, we, we were sure there must have been something that we were missing. We had no idea what it was, but we were like, there's got to be something, right? So we did play with the algorithm uh, a little bit more, and we, we weren't getting anywhere. So after we did a bit more Googling, because, you know, Everyone Googles everything, right? We started to question the approach that we were taking. Uh, and we realized that we needed to understand our data better. Um, you know, there were a number of flaws in this initial approach. We had kind of recognized that there were different tokens. We, we knew that there might be some relations. But perhaps that relation was more important than we had expected. So for example, if someone pays uh, $30 for a purchase, and they're based in Germany, where the average purchase price is about $25 anyway, that's not that suspicious. You go, yeah, that's, that's kind of within the realms of possibility. In Argentina, however, the average purchase price is about $8. So someone making a $30 purchase there, which is over three times more than the average, you start to go, should we be looking at that? Does that, does that need to be looked more closely? Likewise, because high-value purchases are more, are more common in certain places, if a low-value purchase came from one of those, perhaps we need to look at that as well. You know, we don't know whether these are the right answers, but these are the sorts of things that, that you have to start asking. Um, and do we need to consider context? Um, so what I mean by that is, if there's a store where the average item across the store is $3, a $35 purchase would look a little bit odd, because you'd have had to have bought probably 11 or 12 different items to get to $35. But if there's a, a store that actually sells a rank that is $35, then a $35 purchase would be much more expected. Okay? And the other thing that we started thinking was, what about price? So in the, the uh, algorithm we were using before, because it's treated as a word, there's no, there's no sense of, of scale or, or a continuous measure. You know, a price that is 5 euros is different from a price that is 5 euros and 10 cents, even though that we know that actually the difference between the two is negligible. But in that algorithm, they're treated as two wholly separate entities. So perhaps we need to look at something that supports continuous data as well as discrete data. So we started looking for a new algorithm. It wasn't working for us. We still didn't want anything too complex. Our rule still was that we wanted to be able to understand it. We didn't want just to find some fancy algorithm, punch some data in, and it work, and us have no idea why, because that's the worst thing you can do. If you don't understand why something works, at least to a degree, then if you get problems, you're really going to struggle to understand why it hasn't worked if you didn't understand why it worked in the first place. We're still looking at supervised learning, obviously. Um, so after we did a bit more research, we came across an algorithm called K-Nearest Neighbors. Now, K and N is, is fairly straightforward to understand. Basically, it means which K, and K is a number, other results are most similar to this one. So I have this, this, this lump of data. Which ones that are in our training data does this most closely align with? It met a lot of our criteria. Because it's based on distances, it can handle continuous data. And because it's based on distances, there is a level of association between the different data points. If a data point is further out, it makes the whole distance longer. So there is that relation. But if they're all closely packed, the, the overall average distance is shorter. It's not a causal relationship. It's not saying, if this value is x, then this must be y. But it's saying, if this value is x and this value is y, it's, it's going to stretch that dis the average distance much more than it would do with, a, with an expected value. As a side benefit, it is less sensitive to a data imbalance, because it's looking at the local neighborhood. Um, but if there's a large data imbalance, there is still uh, an issue there. Now, the, the easiest way to explain KNN is with a graph. We all like graphs. Um, hopefully, it can be seen on the monitors. I will explain it. So we basically got two. This represents our training data. We have a cluster of blue squares, which is set A, 
and then we have a cluster of white circles, which are our set B. So if we were to add another point, which is represented with a magenta -y triangle, we now are asking the question, which category does this most closely align with? Does it most closely align with the white circles or the blue squares? If we were saying, right, we're, looking, we're setting our value of k to 1, so we're looking for the nearest neighbor, and that's it, then the nearest neighbor will be that white circle right there. If we said 2 and n, so k is now 2, which are the two closest neighbors? There's now 2. Incidentally, this is a good example why we tend to avoid using even numbers for k, because then you have to have some form of tiebreak rule, because at the moment it's a draw. It, one person says, I, I say it's white, the other one says, I say it's blue, and you don't know. You know, flip a coin or something, whatever. Um, so you either have to have a tiebreaker or just much more easily just use odd numbers, which is much straight, more straightforward. So we're going to use an odd number, we're going to say 3. Okay, so we now we have 3, it's 3 and n, k is 3. And the, the first closest was that white circle, then a blue square, then another white circle. So, based on that, which category is it most closely aligned to? The white circles. K and n in a nutshell. This example obviously works on two axes or two dimensions, mainly because it works on a graph. But actually, the k and n algorithm can work on more or less any number of dimensions. It doesn't matter. Um, there isn't any pseudocode to explain this one for good reason. I don't understand it that well. Um, so we're just going to look at an example here. Thankfully, as I mentioned before, there is a machine learning library uh, for PHP. It's called uh, P well, AI uh, slash PHPML. Um, they do loads of cool stuff around AI and machine learning and, and implementations of algorithms so that you don't have to. Um, this is a, a fairly straightforward example. So we've set up some training data. Uh, we've got four that are labeled A and four that are labeled B. And we're saying, right, the, the four A's have these four. They're basically like grid coordinates, but on four dimensions. Uh, four sets of values. So there's eight values in samples, eight in array. We're going to train it with those samples and labels. And then if we give it some test data, so this is a, a new set of coordinates, and say, right, which category does that belong in? And that, I mean, that's, that's, you know, because... The, the library does all the heavy lifting underneath. That's all you have to do. It's awesome. Uh, one more statistic. Yeah, I still don't like live demos. Not, not a fan of live demos. Yeah. Definitely not doing another one. Here we go. So here we go. So this is literally the, the implementation you just saw. It's exactly the same set of training data. I can now just give it four coordinates. So let's go with... I uh, know, two, three, five, one. And it says it's A. If I do five, two, one, one, hopefully it will say it's B, and so on. That's it, simple. Um, if I was to give it something completely random, I mean, who knows? Let's just try it, shall we? Three, four, five, two, one. It's an A. I don't know why, but apparently it is. Um, and this in itself is an important point that you should try things out with predictable data first. You know, if you're using data that you don't fully know, and we don't know, I mean, we have, like I said, we have 18, 19 million payment records. I don't know all the data. Um, try it out on something where you can predict the output to make sure that your implementation works. Even if you're using a third-party library, give it a go on something nice and simple so you can go, okay, yeah, I kind of get that this works, I, so if I, I'm now more confident to plug my own data in. You might have spotted something in that demo about the data samples. Uh, they're all numeric, which is another important lesson. The KNN algorithm, because it's based on distance, likes numbers. Kind of makes sense. I mean, you can't really measure the distance between the word ham and the word cheeseburger. I mean, yes, you, you, obviously you can work out the number of character changes, and that is a distance of sorts, but that wouldn't, be, wouldn't make any sense for what we're doing. We're not looking for typos. Um, so you, you have to kind of go, right, well, actually, our data isn't numeric. Um, so we now need to find a way of making it. So first of all, we thought, oh, well, this is fine. You know, we're, we're a, our database is fairly well designed most of the time. And so things are normalized. We have IDs for this sort of thing, right? So we have a country ID and we have a currency ID. But that doesn't necessarily work. Because you're measuring distance, 
you're therefore implying that the distance between country ID 1, for example, and country ID 2 is less than the distance between country ID 4 and country ID 50. So, for example, in our database, the distance between Australia and Austria would be 1, because it's stored alphabetically, so the ID is only one different. But the distance between Australia and New Zealand, which geographically are much closer than those two, is 160. So that, that's, that's not going to work. That's this going to skew the results a, a little bit. Okay? Now, sometimes this isn't a problem. If you've got data that is kind of sequential, it might have names or words, but it's, it's nominal data that is sequential, like grades at school, you know, that A, B, C, D, E, whatever. You can substitute a, a value. Or in this example, a really old-fashioned company with like really, really structured career progression people. Anyway, but you know, let's say you've got interns and then you've got non-management employees and you've got line managers and you've got department managers and you've got executives. You can you have to estimate, you don't there isn't a fixed number, but you can say, well, within our organization, we think the gap between each one of those is however much. An executive would probably say they should be scored 100 or something, but yeah, whatever. Who listens to those guys? Um, so that, that's not too bad. And if you've got school grades, like I said, you know, an A, B, C, D, E, F, or G, whatever, you, you can assign numeric values to them. Um, if you've got non-sequential data, it's not quite so straightforward. So for countries, for example, we thought about, well, could we use latitude and longitude? Because they're coordinates anyway. But then wh where do you get it from? Do you take it from the center of the country? Because actually, if, if you took it the center of the country, for example, the gap between the center of the USA and the center of Canada would be quite large, much bigger than, say, the UK to Germany. But actually, someone could be either side of the border at Niagara Falls, and the distance they've traveled is negligible. And they could have just picked up a different Wi-Fi network or something. Um, so that doesn't really work. And that wouldn't really work for things like currencies. I mean, you know, how do you score currencies? Do you do it by order of popularity? But what if the popularity changes? You then can't change those numbers. Or what about payment gateways? Again, at the moment, PayPal is the most popular. But what if PayPal wasn't the most popular anymore? You can't swap those values around, and that change, you're still adding an implicit bias. So the simplest solution that we found, i.e., someone told us on Google, is to make everything binary. Now, this makes things, you know, everything is a yes or no, an on or off, one or zero question. Um, so, rather than saying, what is the country, you're now asking a series of questions. Is the country the US? Is the country Great Britain? Is the country France? Is the country Germany? And so on and so on and so on. Um, it does result in a large number of dimensions, obviously, which can have its own issues. There are potentially issues if you've got large numbers of dimensions that are equidistantly spaced, it can make some weird things happen with the dimensions, that, the distances that I totally don't understand. Um, but, yeah, we'll cross that bridge if we get to it. Um, obviously, if there's lots of dimensions, you wouldn't want to generate this data by hand. That would be a really bad idea. Um, and the other thing you need to be careful of is normalizing the data. Uh, because if you, if you don't normalize the data, then your scales can be all sorts of out. If you imagine, just a, again, a two-dimensional graph, if you've got length and is red, okay? So something that is red and is 10 centimeters long and something that is red and is 20 centimeters long has a distance of 10. Even though they could both be chilies, for example, but there's going to be a distance of 10, whatever that means. But you could have an orange that's five centimeters long, and a small chili that's five centimeters long. One of those is red, and one of those isn't red, but the, different, the distance is only going to be one. So it's going to say that orange and chili are more closely associated than the two chilies that happen to be different sizes, because the scale is much bigger on that length dimension. Does that kind of make sense? Some nodding? Good. I'm glad you understand it. Um, so, yeah, so you probably want to normalize things. You can use it to your own advantage to a point. If there are particular dimensions that have a stronger weight in predicting if something's a chargeback or not, in our example, we could say, right, well, actually, we're going to normalize everything to a scale between one and, uh, 0 and 1 or 0 and 10, but for a particular dimension, we're going to normalize it between 0 and 15. So it has slightly more weight than the other dimensions. So you can, you can kind of play with those scales to your advantage uh, to a degree. So let's say we've got some example like this. I like fruit, 
You might have noticed. It's true to love. So at the moment, we've got data in this form. We've got a length in centimeters, um, like height if it's an apple, I guess. Uh, and then a color and a shape. So first of all, we have to go and collect up all the potential values. So what are all the possible shapes and what are all the possible colors? And also work out the maximum length of the fruit. So what is the longest fruit so that we can normalize all of them to the same scale? We're then going to go through all our data, and we're going to literally ask a series of questions. Is it round? Is it crescent? Is it green? Is it red? And assign a 1 or a 0 value to each one of those. We're also going to divide all the lengths by that max length so that the longest fruit is 1, the shortest fruit is probably nearly 0, and everything else is in between. So we've standardized all our scales, and we now have a series of data that looks like some really, really messed up coordinates. Uh, but, it, but it works. Literally, we have a length. Is it round? Is it crescent? Is it red? Is it green? Is it yellow? Is it orange? So, yeah, now we have everything. All that stuff that was, current, that was previously words is now numbers. You know what? If I'm going to do one demo, I might as well do three, right? Yeah. I thought this was a good idea. So, here we go. Another demo. So again, this is all the same data. I've just spat, spat it out so I can remember what it is when I'm looking at this. But for example, if we've got something that's five centimeters, and it's round, and it's green. I mean, we know it's probably going to be an apple. But let's just make sure. Yeah, so it's an apple. And again, this is that, that point of use predictable data first to make sure you've not screwed something up horribly somewhere, as we did the first, second, and third times. Um, let's go, so let's go six centimeters and round and orange. It's going to be an orange. Incidentally, to try and throw the data off, I've included some blood oranges, but told it they're red. I know technically they're not red, but just bear with me. Hopefully, it's clever enough to know. So if I say something that's you know, bigger than an apple, let's go nine, um, and is round and is red, hopefully, I should have tested this first. Whew, that's good. It worked. So there we go. And so we're still providing words, but you can see for each one of these, it's taking the words we provided, round and red, and it's converting them into it, it is round and it's not crescent, it is red, it's not green, it's not yellow, it's not orange. And so it's converting them all to those same set of coordinates as we converted our training data. So that's, that's pretty cool. So this is what we did. Uh, we took that data, that we, the same set of dimensions, but we converted them all into binary and, and normalized the, the prices and things. Um, I, the, the, the test data was all about 200 dimensions, I think. Uh, so it's quite big. And again, we did the test with 2018 providing the training data, 2017 providing the test data. And it, it, it is better. We're getting there. The accuracy is, excuse me, is still not brilliant. It's about 62.5%. But the false positives have come right down. Bear in mind, on that first test, the false positives were 72, I think it was. You know, they've dropped to 42, so that's really, really positive. Um, so you know, we're definitely moving in the right direction. But we're obviously not there yet. You know, if I was to say to, to my CEO, hey, let's put this into production, I wouldn't have a job. Um, so yeah, we still kind of are going, right, well, what can we do to make this more accurate? We know this seems to be moving in the right direction, so we're going to stick with this. Um, but we need to understand why it's so hit and miss. And we struck across, i.e., someone told us, another important lesson. Data without context isn't very useful. Now, we had already kind of touched upon this, because in that very first example, we had put the country and the gateway together as one token, because we knew that there had to be some interrelation. But given, when we got all excited about, oh, yeah, Ken Allen is going to solve all the problems, we kind of totally forgot about it. It's a bit stupid of us, really, wasn't it? <laughs> Anyway, so we started thinking that perhaps we needed to look at that in, in a bit more detail. Um, so consider two stores. Again, we've got a store where the average price is $3, and the highest price item is $5. We've got another store where the average price is $30, and the highest price item is 50 Yes, it makes it much easier if you multiply by 10. Uh, so if you've got a player who normally makes all their purchases from France, and they make a purchase worth $20, or, so these are two things to consider. That didn't make sense. As the other consideration is consider a player who makes all their purchases from France with an average price of $20. And all of a sudden, they make a purchase worth $40, and they're based in the US. Same player suddenly has moved and is making more expensive purchases. I can tell you, if you move, you can't afford anything. 
Um, so in either of those situations, if someone was on the first store and they tried to make a check out a basket worth $50, you're probably going to go, that seems odd. I mean, it could be that there's a bug. It's probably a bug. Um, but y you know, th th there's something going on, and, and you would hope that your machine learning would flag this. Um, and likewise, if the average price of things is 30 and someone buys something really cheap, they've obviously dug out the cheapest item in the store, and they're buying one of them when no one else does this. Again, that would be odd. And in the second question, you'd be asking, well, is that, has that person moved from France to the US and is buying more expensive stuff, or is someone playing silly buggers? Probably the second. So you have to kind of be able to apply this context, which you can't do when you're dealing with data on a, on a global basis. So we realized that um, you know, we need to start thinking about what's normal for one store might not be normal for a different store. Um, so we kind of need to start asking two questions. You know, the, we're going to say for each payment, is this normal for this store? And is this normal for this player? It means building a lot more different sets of training data. Boo. But hopefully, if it's more accurate, then I'm going to look really clever. So there are issues with this that we'll come on to. Um, but we wanted to kind of start going down this road. And this, this is the thing that we're, that we're working on at the moment. Um, so we created a custom test data set for one store. We weren't going to build something to build data sets for every store to start with. We wanted to check our, our you know, validate our expectations first. Again, use something that you can understand and try and test things out before you spend hours building it. Um, so we took their, their charge racks in 2018, we quadrupled them, and then took 5,000 good payments at random. Uh, and then we ran the exact same test. So we're still using the KNN algorithm we did before. Everything's been done the same way just to see if it's any more accurate. And again, I mean, it's not perfect, but we're still, the point is every time we're moving a bit closer. Okay. So you know, the false positives are high still, but they're coming down. We've actually done a really good job of identifying the, the fraud transactions. Um, so an accuracy overall is about 70%. So we're progressing. We've not finished on this yet. This, that's about as far as we got with, with, with the source stuff. We've got a number of things we want to try. Um, weighting different dimensions. I've already mentioned this. If you've got certain dimensions that you think or you can prove are a better indicator than others, weight those more strongly than, than other dimensions. Um, setting different values for K. You know, we're using, we've used 3NN in all our tests. Actually, perhaps by taking a bigger sample, maybe setting it to 7NN or 9NN, 9NNNNN, you might find a, you, you might get a better result. Um, removing outliers, that's something that we're actively working on. If you've got particular outliers, they can be skewing your data. Now, you can actually use KNN to identify the outliers in your training data to then remove them to then make your training data better representative. Uh, something I'm working on at the moment, at the moment it doesn't work, but I've been told you can definitely do it. Um, and weighted distance is something that particularly we're interested in. If you imagine, if you, if you say you've got three, three NN, okay, you've got your, your point is here, I'm just pointing to space now, it's really, really unhelpful, and you've got a, 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 point, a neighbor right next to it. You look at that and you go, well, they're probably related. But then actually the next two closest are in the other category and they're way over here, because in a standard KNN implementation, every node has the same vote, it's going to be associated with those two that are further away rather than this one that's next door to it, which might be right, but it's probably not. So there are kind of modifications you can do to the KNN to actually say, right, well, if a, if a node is closer, its vote is worth more than one that's further away. So you can wait in that distance so that that, that also plays an effect. And, and that's something that we're particularly interested in because we think that is going to make it uh, significantly more accurate. But we also wanted to try per customer detection. Now, this is a very narrow context. Some customers might only have 10 purchases. And they may never have charged back. So obviously, being able to categorize it isn't going to work. You can't upsample data that doesn't exist. Um, again, SKCD, quite amusing. Statistically significant boyfriends. I don't know. Um, so we have to kind of change our thinking. What we're now doing instead of classifying is we're trying to look for something that's dissimilar to the normal, something that is an outlier or an anomaly. Now, there are other algorithms that will do this, but we've kind of got used to KNN. We kind of understand how it works. And bear in mind, it's based on distance. We're thinking, well, could we use distance to identify an anomaly? 
If all the data belongs to one category, yes, the result will be that category, but if the distance is 69 billion, we're gonna go, that's probably not actually that related. So we started playing with this idea. Um, so we kind of, we definitely didn't end, edit the vendor directory, honest, no. Well, okay, we did a little bit. So we edited the vendor directory, and we added this extra thing to work out the average distance. So it works out which nodes it's related to, and then it adds those together and divides by the number of nodes it found, and says, right, so the average distance for this point that you've asked us to predict is x. So the theory goes that if it's a bigger distance, it's less related, or if it's a smaller distance, it's more related. Again, we wanted to test this out on known data before we just went ahead and you know, started plugging our data in because then we'd have no idea. So look, we got fruit again. Ooh. This is exactly the same data set as that previous demo. Um, but this time, you see we're, we're spitting out the, actual, the, the, the total distance, not the average distance, apologies. Um, so in this one, you know, it's likely, it's, we know it's going to say it's a banana because it's longer than an apple or an orange, and it's a crescent, but we've told it it's red. So we, we know it's going to say it's a banana, but it's not going to be that sure it's a banana. And it's returned a total distance of seven. Now, we have no idea what that means. Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. So we'll carry on. So we plugged another one in. This time, we said it was long, it's the longest banana we've ever seen. Um, and it's still, a, it's still banana shaped. It's still a crescent. So it will still end up in that banana category. But it's also green. So we're not going to eat this banana because there's something wrong. And again, it's now the total distance has gone up a little bit more. So it was 7.0, now it's 7.7. Uh, you know, so we're seeing that the, the less normal we make it, the bigger the distance gets. But we still don't know what normal means, really. So now we've, we've done one that's slap bang in the middle. It's 12 centimeters, it's a crescent, it's yellow, and the total distance is 0.12. So we've now validated our assumption that the bigger the distance, the, the weaker the relationship. So now we just need to be able to apply it to our data. I mean, that can't be difficult, right? Um, so we, obviously, we've had to identify some players that had good payments and chargebacks. We kept all the chargebacks to one side so that we could use those to test distances. The other thing that we need to do is, obviously, we have to validate our assumptions. So with that pool of good payments, we had to withdraw a couple to hold those back to test against the training data to make sure those distances are indeed smaller, and actually we've not just come up with something that happened to work on fruit, and you know, not being fruit pickers doesn't help. Um, so this is what we did. We, we trained it on a, for that particular player. We grabbed all their payment data, took a couple of good ones out, stuck the rest of it in, then tested it against chargebacks and the remaining good payments just to see what the values would be. So here's one, and we can see this is a pretty good start. The good payments that we tested all had you know, an average distance of around 1.4, 1.6, and we can see that the chargeback payments are quite clearly much higher. So that's, that's a good start. Um, this one's a little closer. I mean, we have got a chargeback that's 0.8 and a good that's 0.8. There, it is still larger, but obviously it's a much, the, the, the gap between them is much, more, uh, much smaller, but there is still a clear line between the goods and most of the chargebacks. This one, okay, it's not so clear cut, so we know it's not going to work in every situation. Um, this one, you know, they've got this, this, this one with an average distance that's absolutely minuscule, but then we have got the, this other good payment that overlaps the chargebacks. But, you know, we, so we know it's not going to fix everything, but that's okay. Uh, again, there's a much clear delineation. The, the values in general are much smaller, so there's a lot of naught point whatevers here but then the good payments have got like, really, really small distances. So it, basically, they've made almost identical payments multiple times. Um, and again, a, there's a fairly clear delineation here. So we can see that in, in many situations, the distance does correlate to a chargeback tends to be more unlike the other payments than good payments, if that makes sense. Um, but what is also clear is we can't just pick a, an arbitrary number and say, this is the line. Because, you know, let's say we picked one. That would be great for most of these. All of these are above one. But on here, we'd miss most of them, even though actually it, they were still clearly different from the others. So we can't just pick a single value and say, this is it. We're going to have to basically define for each user what an outlier is in their situation. 
Um, so the way we did that is we've now, we calculate the average 3NN distance against the known values. So with that training data that we give it, we then loop through every single piece of training data and work out its average 3NN from its neighbors. And then we work out the average of that. So we can say the average distance between the nodes in our training data is this. We then work out the standard deviation, because something about statistics. Wow. Um, and then we add them together and we go, right, if it's greater than the average distance plus standard deviation, we're then going to flag the payment. So the, you know, what, what the, the target point is, or what the, the delineating mark is, will be different for every single player. We know, even just looking at the, the tape tool we ran before, that that's going to miss you know, some chargebacks, but that's okay. Our target isn't to reach chargeback zero. For a start, not all chargebacks are fraudulent chargebacks. Some of them are genuine, so we're never going to catch those. But if we could reduce chargebacks by 20%, for example, that would relate to nearly 5,000 payments over 2018. So that's, that would still be a pretty big win in itself. Um, and, and that's an important point, is know what you're trying to achieve. If you want to achieve chargeback zero, in our instance, this is never going to work. and We'd have to do something way more complicated, and probably way more expensive, and it probably wouldn't be worthwhile. If we just want to be able to you know, reduce them by a proportion, then we can kind of accept those trade-offs. Um, so we did a test, and we tested with about 1,000 uh, payments in total. So there were 366 good payments, uh, 786. So again, we just identified like 100 players that we knew had done chargebacks and good payments. We pulled all their data out. We hived off three of each, um, I think it was, as our kind of, you know, our control group, if you like, and then the chargebacks, then we plugged in the training data, worked out the average, and it identified 85% of good payments successfully. So that's really positive. You know, a 15% false positive rate is, is definitely much more where we want to be. If it's 50% false positives, people will, will ignore the data. They'll just go, well, I have no idea because you're saying so many legitimate payments are fraud. This doesn't make sense. I give up and they won't use it. You have to be able to convince people, actually, if it flags something, you need to pay attention. Um, you know, the, the, it only, only identifies 31% of chargebacks, but that's still 31% that we're currently not doing, and that would still be a reduction of about 7,000 payments in total over 2018. So that's, that's still a big reduction. I would be more than happy with that as a starting point. Oh, in, in short, we've made progress. Uh, this is another really good comment, uh, comment called Commit Strip about life in a digital agency. Uh, I don't know if you, you may not be able to see it, but it, it's quite, it does amuse me. So they're celebrating because they say, yeah, yeah, we've done it, we've done it, woo! And the CTO comes in, he says, what's going on? Uh, and the guy says, oh, we've been stuck on this bug for two hours. And he's, on, and he's fixed it, that's awesome. And they've gone, no, the bug's there, but the error message is different. <laughs> that's progress. Um, so we are totally not at the end yet, however, if I was to say to my CEO, I want to put something like this into production, we're only going to be, we know we're only going to be identifying a small percentage of chargebacks, but we can say with relative confidence they are probably going to be chargebacks you know, one, you know, down the line. I could, we could say that with, with, with reasonable confidence. You, know, you might get a, a few payments that get flagged that are legitimate. That happens. I mean, whose bank has texted them and gone, there's been a car transaction we don't recognize it. It's like, yeah, well, it was me. I just did something unusual happens with humans. Um, but it, it, you know, that's much closer to something that we can actually use. There are still things that we're going to try. You know, again, the weighted, uh, the weighted uh, dimension, uh, distances thing we think is probably a really good thing that we're going to experiment with. Um, and again, removing outliers, that's something that we're actively working on at the moment, but it takes quite a long time to churn through the data. But you know, we, so we think we can make it you know, more accurate, but actually we're quite pleased with, with the progress we've made so far. So for TEBEX, this is still very much the beginning. You know, we've continually, you know, we set out our aims early. We knew that we, you know, we knew we weren't going to get to charge back zero, but we knew that more important was to not flag false positives. That was really our big goal: is identify some chargebacks without causing, you know, bad flags at the same time. We've redefined those slightly as we've gone along. We've gone from saying we're going to use all the data to saying we're going to look at it by store. But having that aim in mind means you can focus what you're trying to do. Rather than just throwing algorithms at stuff and seeing what happens, you can start focusing it a lot more. You know, you have to, it, it is complex. Machine learning is hard. We've tried to use techniques that we understand. 
because it means when stuff doesn't work, we have half a chance of knowing why it doesn't work. Yeah, some, sometimes it's taken a bit of Googling. Most of the time it took a bit of Googling. But yeah, because we have some grasp of what's going on, we can go, OK, yeah, no, I, I understand why that doesn't work, or I understand why this does work. And it means that we can change how we're doing things. We can change our data choices. We can change our metric choices, our dimension choices, whatever it might be, to improve those results. We might consider more complex algorithms in the future, but ultimately, if you can understand what's going on, if you can understand why something works or why something doesn't work, that's half the battle. As I've said a couple of times, try it with simple data first. If you've got a lot of data that you don't necessarily fully understand, test your implementation on something that you do. You know, something as silly as fruit. It seems ridiculous, and you know, I, I spent you know, an hour writing something that would classify fruit. That's of no use. But it meant that I knew that how we were implementing it did work. And therefore, if we didn't get the results we wanted, it's not the fault of the implementation. It's either that we've picked the wrong algorithm or, or the data's not any good. So you know, make sure that you know that, you know, remove those technical question marks first. We've learned a lot doing this. We've done it all by experimentation. You know, as I said, I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a data scientist. Um, I, I, I wouldn't claim to be in a million years. Um, the fact I won't be alive for a million years helps. Um, so just try things out. Stuff will work, stuff won't work. If, if you learn a lesson each time, and you, like we went from that one where everything was classified as not fraudulent, and we've now, you know, we've taken a step, and we've learned something, we've taken another step, we've learned something. So something that actually we can now try and integrate into our production application, at least on a limited scale, and then we'll carry on iterating and improving more. So uh, thank you. I think we're literally about at an hour, but if there are a couple of questions. Yeah, I mean, if uh, anybody's got any questions, and now I've got half of Hello. Um, oh, I've got the written stuff down. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's working. OK. <laughs> So basically, you talked about a K and N algorithm, which is uh, basically making the decision on one or zero or yes or no. Mm -hmm. So it sounds a bit similar to uh, the decision tree algorithm. Is it so? Or um, I, I guess it is in that sense, except with, with the decision tree, as, as I understand it. Um, this is why I'm going to show that I know nothing other than what's on the slides. Um, you know, you're going down that path. So that's when I said, like with KNN, there is a relation between different dimensions, but it's not a if you go down this path, you have to carry on down this path. Each data can just move the, the distance back and forwards. Whereas in the decision tree, you'll go, you've made this decision, now you're branching that way. You can't suddenly be moving across because you've already made a, a predetermined decision further up. But it, it's kind of, yeah, I, I guess it works in a, in a similar way. Uh, how did it work performance-wise? Like, how much data did you have to use for training, and then when you had to make a decision, how much time Sure, did so take? because we, we were downsampling our good data and upsampling our... Um, on the global tests, the, the training took about two hours. Um, a lot of that, to be fair, was fetching the data. So we had to pull that down from the database and then reformat the data. And you couldn't do that in real time. What you'd have to do is you'd have basically have to have a, a running daemon that had the training data plugged in that was just listening for a, hey, can you give me a decision on this payment? So you do the training once and leave that as a long-running process, you know, either in PHP or in Go or you know, whatever. And then you would just literally have an API endpoint that says, this is a payment, tell me what you think. And it, so it wouldn't have to retrain every time. It would just then give you an answer back. Thank you. No right. So you were mentioning when you were training your um, machine learning that you were st originally you started using all the dimensions from the payments, mm -hmm. um, and then you said you removed some of them. Uh, I guess a was there a criteria you used to determine which dimensions to remove, and b in the ones you kept, did you notice any correlation in the fraudulent payments? Um, <laughs> A, not really other than instinct. I mean, we, we did. So we took, at one point, for example, we took out country because we were like, well, actually, perhaps the country isn't that relevant. 
and the accuracy dropped by about 20%. So we're like, no, we'll put that back in. Um, so th if I'm honest, there are, there are statistical ways of doing it that are way beyond what I understand. So in, in our experience, we did trial and error. We took stuff out and went, no, that didn't work. Or we took stuff out and went, actually, that's either improved it or not made any difference at all. So we'll leave it out. Um, and obviously, the ones where, for the original uh, Naive Bayes, we'd clump stuff together to make two things into one. Obviously, we could get rid of that because that light, you know, re light relation, if you like, between the points existed in, in the KNN anyway. So, but no, it was trial and error. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you.